Good morning, everyone. My name is Allison Arnold. I am the Agriculture Extension Agent here with the Cooperative Extension Service in Buncombe County. I will be your host today. I want to welcome you to Learning Garden Presents Introduction to Botanical Dying. Our speakers today are Pat Strang and Joyce Tromba. Pat and Joyce are Extension Master Gardener volunteers here in Buncombe County, and they are working to establish our own dye garden in the learning garden here at the office. Using common household equipment, Pat and Joyce will demonstrate how to prepare and dye fabric and wool to achieve that deep, long-lasting color from plants. Take it away, Pat and Joyce. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. A really quick introduction about us. I've been doing natural dyeing for about 10 years mainly self-taught, although I have had the opportunity to take some classes and read a lot of information from books. I'm a pretty new master gardener, so I would say my expertise is more in the dyeing and the gardening, whereas Pat... I've been a master gardener for almost 15 years now in two different areas. I was in Virginia to begin with, and now I've been here for seven years. I'm new to natural dyeing. Joyce was a big inspiration to me. I'm a sewer and a knitter, and so... My interest in this from the plant standpoint, but also from the fiber standpoint, it just is a perfect match for me. So uh, really interested, but I'm brand new to this. Okay, so before we share our screen, I just wanted to show you what the colors you can achieve from design, because I think a lot of people think that the colors you get from natural dyeing are some version of beige, yellow. So really you can get in the rainbow. These are on yarn. This is all natural dyes that I've done. Mostly plants that I've grown or foraged for. We'll be talking about a few things that you can't get locally that you do have to purchase, but most of these were with plants from here in Western North Carolina. Here is another example, linen. So we'll talk a little bit later about the difference between dyeing on what we call protein fibers, wool, and cellulose fibers. This is an example of it. You can see you pretty much get the full range of colors. In person, you may not be familiar with. So this is about half of a stalk <laughs> of my weld plant that I just cut off this morning to show you. My weld is now well much taller than I am. I'm not very tall to begin with, but still, uh, you know, it grows to be about five and a half, six feet tall. Another one you may not be familiar with is indigo. It's a pretty plain looking plant. But this is the magical indigo that gives you that blue that I'm sure you're all familiar with. It does get pretty little flowers on it, which you'll yeah. be able to see better in the pictures when we show the slides. And you'll see a picture, too, of a bruised leaf, and you'll see that it kind of flashes that blue. And the next one is matter is really probably the ugly duckling in the group. Not much to recommend it. It's scraggly. It grows close to the ground. It has a very coarse, almost kind of a velvet velcro feel to the leaves but it's not the leaf that gives you the dye it's the roots and it's probably hard to see but these are the matter roots they are red I'm sure it's hard for you to see yeah they actually look a little orange on the inside a lot of the other plants we'll talk about will be more familiar to you this is going to be kind of like a cooking show we are going to be doing something while we chat so we're actually going to be dying so I'm just going to shift the computer over mm -hmm. so you can see what we're doing here so we're in Pat's kitchen here at her cook top. So here I have the fiber that I'm going to dye today, and I have it in a bowl of water. And again, we'll be talking more about fiber preparation, but you always want to have your fiber, what's called wetted out. So when you put it in the dye pot, the dye will dye it evenly. I have a little skein of yarn here. The dye is made from a combination of matter and weld. We'll talk about the colors in a bit, but matter gives you colors in the red to pink to orange range and well gives you yellow. So we should expect some kind of a reddish orange color. And this is just a piece of linen. So they're going into the dye pot. They've been prepared because the preparation takes some time. We didn't have time to do everything on camera, but I'll be talking about that step by step as we go along. So they're in the dye pot. I'm going to have this just below simmer as we 
go through the presentation. We're going to share our screen now. We're going to go through several things today. Joyce is going to talk a little bit about natural versus chemical dyes or synthetic dyes. I'm going to talk a little bit about a brief history of where natural dyes have come from into the chemical dyes as well. We're going to talk about choosing the plants to grow, forage, or purchase. I don't know how many of you were actually on our first class that we did this year on choosing the plants. Back in April, we did a class about starting the dye garden. We just started our dye garden out at the learning garden at the extension office. Joyce will talk about equipment and how to prepare fiber and plants for dyeing. After we're done with the slideshow, we'll actually take the stuff out and show you the colors we've got. And we're going to give you some resources. And I believe you also have these resources on your handout. And we're going to tell you a little bit about the upcoming seminars that we have going on in August and September. So just a little bit about the difference between natural and synthetic dyes. First of all, that term natural doesn't really have a strict definition and people use it to describe all kinds of things. But in terms of what we're talking about today and dyeing, basically a natural dye comes from something that's living. So obviously a plant, uh, fungi also can give you very good natural dyes. And there's a few animals that are also used for dyeing. Not many, but a few little insects. All of synthetic dyes come from the byproducts of the petrochemical industry. And I don't think I need to go into the problems with that in terms of climate change and the production of CO2. I, I won't get into that or that would take me a whole hour to talk <laughs> about, but I, I think you guys know the problems there. So when we are finished with natural dyeing, the byproducts are all non-toxic. So they can go right down the drain and the plant material, once you've extracted the dye material from it, can go in your compost pile. The byproducts of synthetic dyeing can be very toxic and polluting. Actually, the textile industry is one of the most polluting industries in the world, and especially the dyeing in third world countries where regulations are not followed as they should be. The other thing is a little less objective maybe, but I think there's an aesthetic difference. I think you could have seen through the colors that I showed you, all the colors are somewhat subtle and harmonious. There's a saying that all colors of natural dye go with all the other colors. That's certainly not true if you're picking colors from synthetic dyes. Also for me personally, especially since I've gotten into gardening, I love the fact that I can grow something in my yard use it to dye with, put the plant material back into the compost pile. And I don't know if you want to call it ethical or spiritual, but it's that connection with the living world. I love when I'm going for a hike in the woods, I can notice something that's a good dye plant. And if it's okay to do it, to take a little bit of it home. So that's less of an objective reason to do it. But, you know, it's certainly different than buying a jar of chemicals and dyeing it that way. So just a really brief history. We live in a world so full of color, I think it's hard for us to think about what it was like before there was color in our clothing. Archaeologists have found evidence that goes back 12,000 years where they can find some natural dyes. I like to go back and think about when man first started wearing clothes, everything had to have been beige. But I think being in nature, all the colors that they would see would be in nature. And through cooking or trying to find medicinal stuff, they would discover that there was color, whether they got it on their hands or got it on their clothes and they learned to process it. Then I think the color evolved into things like social standing or belonging to community or just marking rituals. We think about royalty wearing purple and going to funerals wearing black. And of course, all of our sports teams and our schools have these colors that we uh, associate with. Even wartime, if everybody was wearing gray, who would you know was the enemy. So I think color has evolved over time. Now we just take it for granted, I think. The discovery of the chemical dyes in the 19th century really excited a lot of people because they could be created in large quantities, which the commercial industry absolutely loved. It probably didn't affect personal dyers very much. Certainly the commercial industry was very excited about it. They could do it in large quantities. They were easier to use. They could use them on synthetic fabrics. Joyce has already talked about, we're going to do natural dyes on natural fibers. Natural dyes don't work on synthetic fibers, but chemical dyes do. So that was a whole new world opened up there. And then in the 21st century, people have become more sensitive to the environment. The chemicals really can be very toxic to the environment, and we have a huge sensitivity towards that now. So even though, you know, the chemical dyes are never going to go away, there's a lot of people 
leaning towards the natural dyes for the purpose of saving the environment. And there's dye gardens becoming very popular in botanical gardens. If you've been out to the Arboretum, they have a dye garden out there. I think gardeners in general, just like the idea, Joyce has explained her connection to being able to dye her fibers with the stuff that she's grown. I love to do vegetables, flowers, and dye gardens. Mm -hmm. So uh, today we're going to talk about <laughs> the plants that you can grow, forage, and purchase. We are only going to concentrate on dyes that we feel are light and wash fast. What that means is that the color is not going to degrade from the sunlight. You know, in thousands of years it will, or maybe even hundreds of years, but you're not going to see that thing fading in a matter of weeks. Also, you can wash it and the color's not going to wash away. There are lots of claims on the internet and you can see little quick videos of people dyeing their t-shirt with avocado skins and getting pink and it's so exciting, but that color is not going to last. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that because you could just dye your t-shirt in avocado skins or pits. So, you know, this concept of how long the color lasts it is really up to your personal preference. We have chosen to tell you about plants that we know will give you long lasting color. So again, if we're not talking about black beans and avocados and red cabbage, there's a reason for that. So that's why you're not gonna see those plants in this presentation. This is a picture of a type of indigo, by the way. Yellow. Lots of things give you yellow. Joyce showed you the weld plant, which is the second on the list there. And that is the daddy of yellows, I believe. It gives you the strongest color. But you can see regular plants that you're familiar with. Goldenrod, chamomile, marigold, cone flowers. Who would have guessed rhubarb would give you yellow? I would have thought red. Mm -hmm. But um, this is the other thing that's really fun about growing these different plants and getting dyes from them because sometimes you get a real surprise. Joyce was just pointing out it's the root, so it's not the stock that we're used to cooking with. There's a lot more that would give you yellow, but we're going to concentrate on some of these really common ones. So red and orange matter. This is a picture of her from my garden. So matter is the king of red. You can find textiles from Tutankhamun, which are 3,000 years old, that would have been dyed with matter. So this is very, very historically important and light, fast color. It's an ugly plant, but it gives an amazing color. The color comes from the root. So the unfortunate thing is when you have to harvest it, you have to pull up the entire plant. Usually you plant it in a three-year rotation because it takes the root three years to get big enough to really make it worth your while to pull it up. Onion skins, lowly onion skins, who knew? Save those yellow and red onion skins. They give a nice orange color and it's very light fast. One of the few things from the kitchen that is really a good natural dye. And then Dyer's Coreopsis will also give you an orange. Indigo. Indigo is the king, king or daddy or blue. <laughs> and so if you have indigo, matter, and weld, you can create all kinds of other colors, just like we've combined today. We're not going to get a, a straight matter. We've combined two colors. So a combination of any of those three will give you a variety of other colors. So the dyeing with indigo yeah. is totally to different that. than everything else we're going to talk about today and really needs to have a whole program on its own. One of the things you can do with indigo is just dye it fresh without heating it, just jizzing it up in a blender with ice. We are going to be doing that in our in-person demo day in the dye garden. So you might want to come and see that. The other way indigo is used is in a vat, which again is very, very different than all the other dyes we're going to be talking about today. It's one of the few vat dyes. You don't heat it, but it requires a lot of chemistry to understand how to set it up. Woad is a plant that was grown in Europe, but has the same pigment, the indigotin, which is in indigo, and there's various um, species of indigo. It's a tropical plant, so it wasn't grown in Europe, but woad can be grown there. Also, it's a very historically important plant. The Vikings would decorate themselves when they went into war with woad. Woad is very invasive, so I wouldn't recommend growing it. If you're very careful and you don't let it go to seed, it is a source of indigo as well. That's it for blue. There isn't another plant that will give you blue. Green, St. John's wort, which we are growing in the dye garden, and nettle. Not a lot that gives you green no, as well. But, but you can combine your indigo and your weld to get your greens. So these were both dyed with indigo and then over dyed with weld. Just like if you were painting, 
you're going to use two colors. So blue and yellow, of course, give you green. The only way to get a true green, like a grass green, is to over dye. It may seem strange that no plants give you that green, but that green comes from chlorophyll, which is a pigment, but it's not a water soluble pigment and it can't dye like the rest of the dyes that we're using. So you can zizz up any kind of plant and you're going to get this lovely green kind of soup and you can put your textile in there and it's going to look like it's green. But as soon as you put it in the sink and rinse it off, all of that chlorophyll just goes down the drain. I remember as a child growing up, I always had grass stains on my knees, on mm -hmm. my clothes and everything. And a stain is different than a dye. So often people think just because blueberries and berries and right. grass will give you a stain on something, that doesn't mean it gives you a dye. Okay, purple and pink. The first two are not things that we can get here. Logwood, that's a picture of a logwood tree. It's grown in Central America. It's the bark of the tree that gives you a beautiful purple. Cochineal is the only animal on my yes. list. It's an insect that lives on a certain type of cactus and it's actually a parasite of the cactus. The insects are tiny. They're as big as a lentil. They're very small. So they're collected and you actually just grind the insect whole. It gives you a beautiful pink color. The lady's bed straw, the leaves of that will give you yellow, but the roots are one of the few things that will give you that pink and purple color. And the flowers of the hollyhock. This is not a terribly light, fast color. So it's one that we're including, but it's not one that you'll probably pass along a textile to your great grandchildren. And brown, black walnuts. There's a lot of black walnuts around here. People hate them because they make such a mess and they make such a mess because they're such a good dye. People make ink from them. It, it comes from the fruit or the husk that surrounds the walnut. You need to get the fruit when it first falls, when it's very green. You don't want it after it starts to turn brown or black. It does a beautiful brown dye on anything and you don't have to treat it. It's one of the dyes that you don't have to pre-treat the fabric or do anything with. It just gives you a beautiful brown dye. We'll cut your uh, bark from a tree from Asia. You can get it from the dye suppliers that we'll talk about at the end, but it's not a tree that we have access to. Okay, we want to give you guys a chance if you have questions about anything, but particularly about the plants that we've mentioned, or if you know of a plant that we didn't mention and you'd like us to talk about it. My question was, what kind of pot are you using? We're going to get to the equipment in a second, but any non-reactive pot. Could you use a crock pot? I guess those usually have a ceramic inset, don't they? Mm -hmm. So that should be okay. You, you'd want one that's specifically for dyeing. Even though these are natural things, you'd want to keep your equipment separate from your cooking food stuff. Someone asked about onion skins. How long can they be kept for? Oh, I've had some for well over a year. They're quite dry. You know, when you take them off the onion, they're kind of very papery and dry. So I don't find anything happens to them. I just stick them in a plastic bag and I keep them near my onions. If you are concerned about that, you could pop them in the freezer or the refrigerator. I know other people have asked this. So red onions and yellow onions, mm -hmm. not white onions. And red onions give you a different color than yellow yeah. onions. Yeah, they give you green. I usually just throw them together because I don't have that many red onions to keep separately, right. but they do give you a version of a green. So olive green. Hollyhock. What color does hollyhock make? Oh, pink or purple. One thing I didn't mention was the part of the plant that you use, sometimes it's the leaves, sometimes it's the flowers, sometimes it's the bark, sometimes it's the roots, sometimes it's the seed. So you'll get to know which part of the plant you use. Are you using the flower or the root? The flower. Does the flower color depend? Does it matter what color you get from it? I mean, is it related to the flower color? Yes. So you want to use purple or red or the almost black ones. Okay. The, deeper, the deeper the flower, the better the color. Somebody has asked if you would expand on the over dye required for green. So you can do it one of two ways, but through testing and advice of expert natural dyer here in our area, Catherine Ellis, she found that it's best to dye with indigo first because of the nature of the indigo vat. So you're going to dye your fiber first with indigo and it'll turn blue. And then you're going to dye it in anything that gives you yellow. I will say that weld is the clearest yellow. It doesn't have those other overtones. So if you want to get that sort of grass green color, then use weld. really any of the yellow dyes will give you green. So yellow and blue together make green. You can do the yellow first and do the indigo. The issue with that is the alkalinity of the indigo vat will strip the mordant from the fiber that you dyed with the yellow. So the yellow may not stay as much. So over time, the fiber will tend to look 
more blue than green. And she's going to talk more about mordanting and what all that meant. Indigo first and then any yellow. Great. Well, that's all our questions. Thank you. All right. So here's a picture of the equipment. You need a non-reactive pot and you need a heat source. We're doing it in the kitchen here. I use an induction hot plate, but you could use a hot plate. You can use a fire. Some people use a propane tank and die outside. But in all three steps for preparing to die, you need heat. So that's an essential part. Some people do solar dyeing. I haven't done that. In terms of the temperature and time, there's an inverse re relationship. In other words, if you don't have a hot temperature, it's going to take you a lot longer. So if you're happy to keep your fiber in a jar in the sun for three months, you know, you will eventually get good color on it, but I'm usually a little more impatient than that. So you need a heat source, a thermometer, obviously, because you need to know the temperature. Some dyes are more sensitive to overheating than others. The pigment can actually break down if the temperature gets too hot. But a rule of thumb is if you keep your dye bath just below a simmer, you're going to be fine for anything. Uh, a pair of tongs to take the fiber out of the hot dye bath. A scale, if you don't have a kitchen scale, you're going to need one because you need to measure the amount of dye material and the amount of fiber you're dyeing as well as the amount of mordant. All of those values are given in mass or weight. I tend to use mass, so in grams, just because the math is easier. A little scale, this is the scale I use, you know, got it on Amazon for 15 bucks or something. So it's small quantities. Paper, some dyes are sensitive to pH, and especially if you get into indigo, it's important that you can regulate the pH of your vat. So this is just a little drip of paper that <laughs> turns different colors and it has the pH numbers on it. So very simple. Again, you can get this on Amazon. I hate to tell you to go to Amazon, but they also sell it at Earth Guild. If you're local, they're a good supplier. Gloves, that's probably self-explanatory, especially when you're measuring out tremordants and there are some modifiers you can use that you want to not get on your hands. Okay, so we're going to talk about preparing the fiber. There's two categories of fibers, protein fibers and cellulose fibers. And the way that you prepare those fibers are different. We'll start with protein fibers. A protein fiber comes from an animal. So things like sheep, alpaca, goats that make wool, also insects that make silks. The two things that you're going to be probably dealing with herbal and silk that can be in the form of yarn or fabric. Proteins you might remember from high school chemistry are long chains of amino acids. And amino acids have what's called a charge on either end. And you can think about opposites attract. So because there's a charge, a positive or a negative charge, it's going to attract other things that have charges. So because of that, protein fibers are much easier to dye. You tend to get richer colors on proteins. It's easier to prepare them and it only takes one step. The way you prepare any fiber, first of all, is to scour it. Scouring just means give it a really good clean, and that does not mean in your washing machine. It means to put it in a pot on the stove with some kind of a soap and to simmer it for an hour. Even if you get a beautiful white piece of fabric or wool, you'll be amazed once you do this simmering in a soap, the stuff that comes out of that pure white fiber. So it's really important to do that because you're removing wax and oils and different treatments on the fiber. If you don't do that, it's going to make it more difficult for the dye to attach to the fiber. After you do that scouring, you're going to make a solution of a mordant. The precise percentages of the mordant you need are on your handout, so I'm not going to go into that right now. But you make a solution of alum, which is aluminum potassium sulfate. It's the same alum you buy in the grocery store if you're making pickles. So it's totally non-toxic. You make a solution of that, you put your fiber in it, and then you bring it up to a simmer and hold it there for an hour. This is one of those things that if you wanted to not do that, sometimes I just put my fiber in an alum solution and leave it there for a week. So it's that time versus temperature. But if you wake up one morning and you want to do some dyeing, then you're going to have to heat it up in the alum solution. Cellulose fiber. These are fibers that come from plants. 
So cotton, linen, ramy, rayon, with a little bit of an asterisk, it does come from trees that had some chemical treatment, but originally it came from a plant and hemp. These are all made up of cellulose. So cellulose is made up of alternating units of glucose. They don't have any charge. So that makes them kind of inert and kind of uninterested in making bonds with anything else. Cellulose fibers are a little bit harder to dye to get a good rich color and they require a two-step process. First, you're gonna scour your fiber like you did with the wool, and then you're going to use tannin. There are many sources of tannin. There's things in your garden you can use for tannin, or you can buy a powder tannin. You're gonna treat your fiber with tannin, and then you're gonna treat it with a molecule of an aluminum salt. They're both aluminum salts, but this is aluminum acetate. And now the, the tannin helps the aluminum acetate to adhere to the fiber, and the aluminum acetate, because it has a charge to it, will allow the dye to adhere to the fiber better. Again, the details about how to use these mordants are on your handout. So you said you can find tannins in your garden, just with a couple oh, examples. Yeah, rhododendron, sumac, oak galls are a really good source of tannin. So if you find them, they're like gold. The reason is they don't have any color whatsoever. A lot of tannins have a little bit of a color to it, usually a little bit of a yellow color. If you really don't want that yellow, then the oak galls are good. One of the suppliers, when we get to that slide, Mewa has a selection of 10 different kinds of tannins, and they explain which ones are colorless, which ones have a little bit of a color to them. You've got your plant material, whatever you're supposed to be using. If I was going to use that weld, I would use both the leaves and the flowers, but not the stalks. I would just take that plant material off, put it in a pot, add enough water so that the plant material was kind of free-floating. First, I would weigh your dry plant material because that is what you use to calculate. There's a different calculation if you're using it fresh, but basically you still need to know the weight. Then you put it in a pot with some water and like everything else, you bring it up to a simmer and hold it there for about an hour. Doing that will extract the dye from it. You don't need to do anything else. Some things, especially barks, might take a little bit more time, but basically an hour is a good rule of thumb. And then you just strain off the plant material. Some people will do this all in one. So they'll put the plant material in the water and put their fiber in. You can do that and you're gonna get an uneven dye application, but some people like that sort of modeled uneven effect, especially with flowers, some people do that. But generally this is the, the way you do it. So now you've got your and you've prepared your fiber, you've washed it, and you've mordanted it. And now you're gonna put the wetted out fiber in. You saw that before we even got started, I had my fiber in a bowl with water. So I'm gonna put that in a solution at room temperature. We cheated a little bit here. Uh, you don't wanna put wool, especially from cold water into a hot dye bath because it causes the fibers in the wool to felt. The best thing to do is put it in a room temperature dye bath and then slowly bring the temperature up. That's true, whatever kind of fiber you're using. And again, you keep it there for about an hour. Sometimes you'll get a color you like maybe in 30 minutes because you can get a range of shades, of course, with your natural dye. So let's say you want a really light shade. You don't have to leave it in there for an hour. If you like the color, you can pull it out. Of course, it's going to be uh, a little bit lighter because wet things always look darker than dry things. Should we pause and ask questions before we go to the resources? Yeah. Are there any questions, Allison? Someone asked about bamboo, and I asked if they could elaborate on that, and I've not heard back. Well, that's a cellulose fiber. That's a good thing for me to add to that list. Absolutely. That's a cellulose fiber. Okay. Very yeah. good. That was it. Okay. This list is on your handout. Lots of good sources for finding things. The two at the bottom are really blogs. And Joyce mentioned, uh, Catherine Ellis is a local here. She's written at least one book that I have. So this book here, The Art and Science of Natural Dyes. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. She has recipes in there. So if you're just getting started and if you get that book, it just walks you through with a regular recipe. When we were talking about getting the dye garden started out at the learning garden, 
We actually went and saw hers. She's mm -hmm. pretty amazing. She had some indigo plants that were as tall as we yeah. were. Anything else you want to say about those? I guess I'll just highlight a few of these others. The Dyer's Garden was one that we used when we were planning our dye gardens. This is a nice book because it gives you information about plants, but also about combining plants into a garden. Then Jenny Dean is a great resource. Again, she has information about the plant and she has this lovely picture on the side of every plant that shows you what it looks like on wool, what it looks like on cellulose, what it looks like if you don't warden it, what it looks like if you do an iron modification. So you really get a great preview of what the plant is going to give you. Yeah. And all those variety of things that you do with the different wardens and the different treatments, you can get such a range of colors from one plant. That, that's a great book for that because yeah, it does yeah. give you the whole range. When I started this, it was very complicated to me. It was like, I don't know. But now as you work through it, and that book is a good guide because it tells you exactly what you can use to achieve a certain color. And then the Wild Mountain Time book, that's another local natural dyer. She concentrates on plants that you can forage for. So this is a really nice, it's a self-published book. But it's different than anything else because it's just uniquely to Western North Carolina and the plants that you can forage for. But at the bottom, Catherine Ellis has a blog. She doesn't put things out all that often, but when she does, they are just kernels of wisdom. And Maywa is both a resource, so you can buy all kinds of mordants and, as I mentioned, tannins and natural dye products. But they also are a wealth of information, free information. They have all kinds of handouts that you can download. So they're really a great resource. They are, are in Canada, but I find the difference between the Canadian dollar and our dollar, that's even ch cheaper than most places here to order things. So suppliers, Stony Creek Colors, she's in South Carolina. This is, I think, a wonderful story. This young woman, I think her degree was in biochemistry, but she set up this indigo farming and extraction very close to us. What she did was she reached out to farmers that used to be growing tobacco. Evidently, the, the way that you grow indigo is pretty similar in terms of the equipment that the farmers would have. So she has farmers all over her area growing indigo for her, and they bring it back to her extraction facility. So the extraction technique is pretty high tech, but it's this really nice, close to home, close to our fiber shed operation. She's very careful. She actually gives you the percentage of indigo. She has a high percentage indigo and a medium and a low. You have to be careful, I would say. Some things that are sold as indigo are not really indigo or they're not natural <laughs> indigo. They're synthetic indigo. So this is definitely a place you can trust, especially for indigo. Maywa, as I mentioned, a uh, great source of both products and information. Botanical Colors is another great source that you can trust 100%. They're in California. They also have a lot of information, a lot on their website. They have something called Feedback Friday. Every Friday, they have a natural dyer and they have a free presentation. So every Friday, you have these experts from all over the world talking about natural dyeing. Closer to home is Earth Guild. They're currently not open. You can't go there in person, but you can order online or you can call them with your order and then just pick it up at the curbside. They have a lot of mordants and they have some natural dye. We're very excited to have two more of these demonstrations or seminars scheduled in person, in the garden. August 8th, we're going to be doing a dye demonstration. We're planning right now, and of course it will depend on how the garden does, but uh, we're going to do some dyeing with indigo, some ice dyeing with some fresh indigo. It gives you a teal color. I guess we could have left it in there longer and gotten a darker color, but really but pretty that, teal color. Teal and on September 9th in the dye garden, we're going to talk about harvesting dye plants and the different things that we have there. And of course, we're going to work in the garden for both of those. The Dye Garden is located in what we call the Learning Garden at the Cooperative Extension Service. There's the address. If you're not familiar with it, the Learning Garden is also a great place, not just for the Dye Garden, but there's a vegetable garden, there's a Four Seasons Garden, there's a Rose Garden, there's a walking path. It's just a beautiful place to be. We're very excited to start some in-person things again, and we hope any of you local folks that can come out to the gardens 
on those days that we'll be able to meet in person. Why I guess we're ready to pull this stuff out. Yeah. So we're going to stop. Before you do that, can we catch yeah. up on a couple of questions? Absolutely. Sure. Can you dye already dyed fabric, like reuse already dyed or processed cotton, and then re-dye it with a botanical dye? Absolutely. As long as it's a natural fiber. Natural dyes only work with natural fibers, so they do not dye synthetic fibers. But if it's some natural fiber, the ones that we've talked about, that came from a plant or an animal, absolutely, you can dye it with botanical dye. You may not know exactly what color you're going to get as the botanical dye over dyes the synthetic dye, but give it a whirl. What part of the rhododendron do you use for tannin? The leaf. That gives you a lovely light pink color. So if you don't want that as your base color, then choose one of the other tannins that are colorless, but it's a lovely color, I think. What about fungi and lichens? Yeah, I love dyeing with them. There's a lichen called Punctilia ruda. So Pat has some samples. A couple of lichens will have the pigment in it. The, the common name of the Punctilia yeah. is called rock tripe. And you might've seen these giant pieces of lichen attached to rocks when you've been on a hike. And then there's these that are attached to trees. Okay, this one is so much fun. This is kind of addictive. When you get to figure out which ones they are, you can get a branch that has all different kinds of lichens on it and you can't tell it has to be this specific one. But what you do is scratch the surface, just scratch the surface till it turns white and then you dab it with Clorox and it turns this bright red. So if that happens, you know you have the right one. Yeah, so we, we call that C-positive lichen. You can test any lichen for that, and if you see that red flash, you know that you have the pigment. Now, the preparation of it is a little long. Soak it in a 50% solution of ammonia for about three months. I know that sounds like, oh, I would never do that. But the color is so beautiful, and it's such a beautiful yeah. pigment. It's worth it. And it's so much fun just looking for it. And then mushrooms, too. The Boletus bicolor, which gives you a nice yellowy brown color. The mushrooms that are footed and not gilled, if you press the underside and it flashes blue, they're also good for dyeing. There's a lot of things about mushrooms and getting dyes from mushrooms. I'm not really an expert there, but you could try it. One little trick to do for anything is if you're curious, you forage for something and you wonder if there's any kind of a dye in there. Just bring it home, put it in a glass, and put it in the microwave, boil it for a minute, and see what happens. If you see some color, you don't know for sure that it's going to be a light fast color, but you know that there's some pigment in there. I'm sure that's not how our ancestors did it. No, but they had elders that had that information <laughs> passed down. Anything else? That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to have the big reveal. This fiber has been in here for almost an hour. As you saw, it was white when we put it in. I would have been over here stirring it around and mixing it around, just to make sure I got a good application so the color may be a bit uneven. Here it is on linen. That's a pretty good approximation. It's maybe a little bit browner in person. But when it dries, it's gonna be a little more orange, I think. And then the yarn. That's a lovely, kind of a honey red brown. It's always hard to say the colors of natural dyes because they're always combinations of things. Really any one plant does not have just one pigment in it. It's many, many pigments. So that's why the colors tend to be very rich. And you can see kind of how hard to describe how they're different with yeah. the different fibers. And actually the linen looks a little darker than the wool, which is unusual. So when it dries, it'll be lighter? Yeah, wet things just look darker than dry things. We tried to do a white background there. Yeah, that helps. And of course, a little bit of the dye is on the surface. So when you rinse it, some of it is going to come off. You can even see the difference here between the slightly dry and the wet. Is there another step after that? Are you talking about rinsing it and then drying yeah. it? Are yeah. there other, is there anything else that needs to happen before you actually use it? There's nothing you have to do. There's something called a post dye modification. So there's another thing you can do to either change the color or to increase the light fastness. 
you can make an iron sulfate solution, which is going to what's called sadden the color. So it's just gonna to tone down the color because believe it or not, some of these colors are so bright, like the well, it's kind of like highlight or yellow. Sometimes people like to kind of tone that down and iron always helps to improve the light fastness. So I often do that with logwood because it's one of the ones that are not particularly light fast. But if you don't want to do that, you just rinse it. Do you rinse it wet or do you let it dry and then rinse it? I tend to let it dry and then rinse it. I would actually leave it in the dye pot until the dye pot came back to room temperature. Then I would let it dry, then I would rinse it, and then use the wool wash if I was using wool or a mild detergent for cellulose fibers. Have you ever done any tie dyeing? Yep. I mainly do that with indigo because if you're doing a resist technique, if it's in the dye pot for an hour, chances are even if you've tied it or folded it in a way to resist the dye, the dye is going to seep in there. So that's the difference between natural dyeing and synthetic dyeing. Synthetic dyeing you can do quite quickly in a room temperature bath. Indigo is like that in that you don't have to heat it and the dye hits very quickly. So five minutes in an indigo vat, it's going to give you a dark blue color. So shibori is where tie dye comes from. In Japan, they always used it with indigo. Joyce, right. yep. speaking of indigo, there was a question earlier. Is indigo the only dye where it changes when it hits oxygen? I think there is another vat dye, and I can't remember the name of it. So all vat dyes are the same in that the vat is in reduction. And when you bring the fiber out into the air, because there is 20% of oxygen in the air, it's oxidizing and it's changing color. I can't remember the name of the other vat dye. It's not one that I've ever used or I never hear about, but that's kind of the definition of a vat dye. So indigo or woad or all the species of indigo work in that way. It's a beautiful, amazing thing. You take it out of the vat and it's kind of a yellow or green and you watch it turn blue as the oxygen hits it. It's definitely magical. Can't wait to see the demonstration. Earlier on, you talked about using soap to scour. And mm -hmm. there was a question of, is it only soap or can you use detergent for scouring? You can use detergent if it's pH neutral. I use something called Orvis paste, which I think is a detergent on my wool. You can use Dawn is a pretty mild, I don't actually know if it's a detergent or a soap. There's a chemical difference between that. I think it is probably a detergent. Somebody makes a suggestion about using milkweed bugs to see what kind of color that would make. Interesting. Yeah. Please let me know if you try it. Crush them in a mortar and pestle. And I would have thought that they would have been used traditionally in our area if they did have dye, but who knows? Maybe not. Do you okay. ever use vinegar or cream of tartar? You can use vinegar or cream of tartar to acidify. Some dyes are pH sensitive. Like safflower is very pH sensitive and you can get a range of colors. So that would be a way to acidify it. You can also use cream of tartar with alum because alum is slightly alkaline. So especially if you're mordanting wool, some people put cream of tartar in to neutralize the pH. But it's not the same as synthetic dyes. So a lot of acid, what is called acid dyes with synthetic dyes use vinegar. It's not doing the same thing in this process. It's simply a pH modifier. That's it on the questions. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. We hope if you're local, you can come and see us in person at the dye garden later this summer. Or even just go out and walk around before and just see what's going on. Feel free to go out and walk around the garden. It's a really nice place to walk and to be. So yeah, sign up for our class in August. Thank you, Joyce and Pat, for sharing your knowledge with us today. We've gotten some great kudos and thank yous in the chat box. Bye. Happy gardening.